Welcome everyone. Great to have you at Collision from Home. Okay, let's get straight into it. We don't have a lot of time. So David and SC, we've seen downturns before. What's different this time about the current situation we're in? I think the difference is that um, in 2000, uh, the crash was more about you know, IT and telecom. Um, internet and telecom. Um, 2008 was more around uh, real estate, the ho housing and the financial crisis. Um, I think this one has been more uh, broad. Um, it covers almost every industry um, in every geographic region around the world. Um, and I think uh, that the winners and losers are, are more distinct uh, because um, we have to change behavior our fundamental human uh, behavior until the vaccine probably comes out. I would agree with, with David. It's um, across industries, across geographies, and it's been just like this sudden, like there's a before and an after, right? Some people start to talk about BC and AC before Corona, after Corona. Um, so so there's, a, there's a clear beginning and there's also a, a clear end because the vaccine is really saying like, okay, now we can, you know, all, all go back to quote unquote normal life. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about what normal is, you know, BC and, and AC, but there's, there's a clear beginning, there's a, there's a clear end. And then in between, there's this sort of state of, you know, flux, but as you can see from the stock market, that's, you know, relatively resilient right now, um, there are still some fundamentals in the economy that are pretty strong and people are adapting really quickly to this new reality. So despite the massive rates of, um, of unemployment, uh, the economic fundamentals re remain very solid. And I think that's a big difference compared to any previous downturn, which were all about you know, the economy crashing. Here, it's, it's actually not the economy crashing. It's sort of, uh, yeah, it's been mystifying, somewhat baffling to look at the stock market every day as we are, there are clearly cracks, obviously, every, the way we live every single day is changing till who knows when. Are there lessons, I mean, you, you pointed out the differences between times past. Um, are there lessons you've both taken away from previous downturns that both as an investor and with the entrepreneurs you work with um, that you're sort of leaning on now, you're thinking through? So I think yes, as an I, I will say that what's interesting is to see, you know, I, I think 9-11 is probably one of the closest, um, you know, e event to, to what we're living through now, where when the, you know, the accident and the terrorist attack happened, everybody was in that, sort of state of shock, just like we've been for the past few weeks. And for several years, people were worried about, you know, getting together into large groups, very worried about travel. And, you know, when I, when I say for some time, I, I mean for, for two, three years. But then after that time, there was a, a back to normal, which was extremely close to the previous normal, right? Like, in fact, pre 9-11, and, and post, say, 2003, 2004, not a lot of things changed with one exception, one massive change, which is you know, airport security. Right? Airport security was never the same before and after, and that's pretty much the one big change that came from 9-11. Um, I think we're gonna see something similar in the sort of the medium to long term, where after COVID, there will be that one massive change, whether it's a health passport, whether it's you know, something along these lines, I actually don't know yet. I'm, I'm looking at that actively, but I see one big change. I, I, maybe I'm more like cynical, but I don't believe that life will be completely different two, three years from now, even though for the next two, three years, probably life, life will be completely different. I think from an investor's perspective, um, <clears throat> You know, in terms of tech sector, it's much more akin to the 2000 internet bubble crash. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, I've been in the business for 23, 24 years. And one of the th lessons um, every time a crash happens is that people tend to think that, oh, I can get 
um, a hot series C company now for half the price and people jump on it. And, um, you know, when we track our record of doing uh, those kinds of deals in 2002, 2003, and even 2004, the record's not all that great. And what we found is that, you know, companies that, you know, became hot or doing well, um, you know, people who worked four, five, six years to, uh, to really get to that point, suddenly there's a crash, the, you know, there's a down round, um, equity needs to be refreshed, and then they, you know, fundamentally say, oh my God, I have to work four, four to five more years to get back to where I was. And I think the teams get tired. Um, and, um, you know, the new investors, you know, gobble up most of the um, ec uh, economics. Um, and so uh, many of those companies um, actually don't do quite well. And so this temptation to, oh my God, it's cheap now, you know, you really have to resist it and um, uh, focus on much more earlier stage companies. And we all know that during the down cycle, great companies emerge. And those are typically brand new companies. I, I will, if I can comment on, on this, I, I agree with you, David, that the earlier stage companies are, are where we're, we're looking as well. Our analysis, however, is, is almost opposite as, as yours, where in the 2000 crash, the, the entire technology sector literally like, you know, cr scrum, crumbled. Um, and, and in this crash, it seems like it's the opposite, right? The, the fangs are, the, the stock of the fang is going gangbuster. Uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, investment, we, we see sort of two reactions uh, with, our, with our fellow uh, venture capitalists. Some of them who have a portfolio that's in a more fragile position are completely off the market. They're basically uh, reserving their, their dry powder for, for their portfolio companies. But some who uh, maybe just raise the fund or, or maybe have you know, companies that are already well-funded, and when I say well-funded, I mean you know, 18 to 24 months, they're actually actively looking for deals. And so it's, it's really interesting to see and that's one of the things I love about investing that, you know, every thesis can have a winning um, execution, it, but every thesis can be different. Yeah, I, I think the one difference where I see is I think the current blip in the um, technology market post the crash, it feels irrational to me a little bit. Um, um, you know, many companies, you know, of course, the big guys, you know, whether it's an Apple or Amazon are doing well, but some of the medium sized, smaller tech companies, their stocks going up. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of exuberance that we're seeing again, hoping that things will get better. But I, I just fundamentally don't think a lot of business sectors are going to be the same until a vaccine is done. There is also a question, um, you know underpinning what the way that you're both looking at investing is, especially in the private market. I mean, what happens to the business models? I mean, we've been living through this age for many, many years now, and people have kind of called the end of it for a while of this growth at all costs, especially in the private markets. Um, you know, profitability until obviously, even before this, we were starting to see a shift. But, um, you know, who needs profitability if you can grow and Profit, you could figure out profitability at some point down the road. And it seemed that that had been shifting. What are the business models you want to see um, as investors now? I mean, because growth, does growth go away? I mean, you want to see growth. You want to see. Um, yeah. But, so tell me, what, we, how are you looking at companies now? We definitely want to see growth, of course, you know, and, and, and venture uh, level growth as opposed to, to slow growth or, or survival, which, which we see a lot of company come and pitch to us. We just need some money to, to survive. Like, that's not what we want to see, right? We still want to see that. But, you know, our thesis has not really changed uh, pre and post COVID because I will say we're, we're relatively conservative investors. Like, we will not, like, go after blitz scaling, we will not go after crazy valuations. And so when we compare what we did in 2019 to what we're doing in 2020, in 2019, we, we actually did very, very few deals because there was a little bit of that exuberance 
primarily on, on valuations. I mean, companies were, were growing. Um, I do think that in 2020, companies are going to continue to grow. There might be a little bit more churn. There might be longer sales cycle. Um, there, there might be like some revised estimates. You know, a lot of our uh, portfolio companies are, are projecting you know, flat years in terms of revenue. But um, I'm not seeing a fundamental change in their business models. Yeah, I, um, my perspective is that 2000 and 2020 is very similar. Um, you know, the, the, if you build it, they will come philosophy. Um, and capital intensive uh, business models are definitely uh, out of favor. I think companies that have measured growth, companies that don't require salespeople to visit, um, um, and uh, companies that actually can control their operating expenses on a more variable basis. I think these companies are going to do better and they continue to, to do well. I mean, um, you know, we just took uh, bill.com public in uh, November, I'm sorry, early December, and it's doing well because salespeople don't have to go out and they have great channels. And so there are companies that are doing well in this environment. Uh, conversely, you know, you look at a travel, any company doing travel right now, is in a doldrum. Um, and so it's case by case. Um, and I think that's what's a little bit interesting about 2020 uh, versus 2000 when it was everything was just, everything just crashed. And right now, as you're talking to portfolio companies, um, you know, both the ones, as you said, it's different in different sector by sector and depending on, you know, the specific effect of COVID on the business model. Do you have, both of you have pieces of advice on what advice you're giving to do and what advice essentially not to do, you know, some short-term fixes that might be dangerous for a company. I'd love to hear a little bit of one of each. Sure. Um, First and foremost, uh, you got to cut costs um, because for a short period of time, um, revenue is going to go down or it's going to be flat. Um, and you, you know, you know, the old uh, adage of what um, uh, GE used to do is every year cut the bottom 10, 15 percent. So there's always fat in any organization. Um, you got to cut um, uh, first, um, and then. Uh, you know, create measures to uh, make sure that you keep your current customers uh, warm. Um, and so, you know, you might think that you want to cut sales and marketing, but this is actually a time where you got to continue to keep your current customers warm. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is, you know, if you have a great C, you know, CFO or finance team, they can save you a lot of money. Um, and this is a great time to negotiate with all the vendors that you have in your company um, and you know that a company uses and you can get great discounts now and so those are the three things and ultimately is cash is king you got to survive this period and then go back to measure to growth yeah i'd say on on our end you know, like like david uh on 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 the financials but the, the first order of things in terms of communicating with our portfolio companies was you know, number one look after the the health of your employees and then um you know try try to uh, cut your cost as as much as possible as quickly as possible and and extend your your revenue we we put a, a list together of of resources uh, for all of our portfolio companies, giving them, you know, tips, articles, links to, to get all of that. And, and these were basically the, the three topics. Keep your employees healthy and performing, uh, extend your runway, and, and focus on sales. Great. And in the, in the little time we have left, one final question. You mentioned this, SC earlier, normal. You know, who, who, any ideas of what that might, what this new normal could possibly look like in our work life, um, in our, you know, in our life and how, you know, when we're going to see this, I'd love to hear what you both think before we wrap up. I think social distance is going to be um, around for until the vaccine is done. And we, you know, we totally assume a vaccine is going to be around. And this could be like a cold where, you know, the virus keeps on mutating. 
and uh, we might be in this state for a long time coming. And so um, I think trying to figure out normal, uh, we should be conservative and um, it may never go back to normal. And I think that should be the working assumption. We, um, I, I, I mentioned, I, I, I'm more of the, the, the camp that says everything will go back to normal with probably one big change. Uh, we're actually right now as a, as a partnership talking to a lot of different experts in the verticals that we cover or that we have a, an interest in to really brainstorm, like where is that new normal going to emerge and how and what's that one big change going to be? Uh, whether it's you know the the health passport, whether it's the social distancing, like David mentions, um, we'll see. Uh, well, thank thing. you. More masks, more masks. That's for sure. <laughs> We're all in the you know they're they're becoming increasingly fashionable. The ones that I've seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's all we have time for. There's a lot more to come from Collision at Home. Thank you so much, Essie and David. It's great talking to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having me.